Let's answer some questions about the Israel-Gaza war. It's been almost two weeks since Hamas attacked Israel, and Israel responded with a massive assault on Gaza. Thousands have been killed. The UN says Gaza is facing a humanitarian catastrophe. There's anger across the region about the impact on Palestinian civilians. And talk of this spilling into a much bigger conflict. There are running street battles at the moment. Protesters have been trying to break through the security barrier outside the embassy. Uh, they're throwing stones. The whole region is at the brink of falling into the abyss. I've been asked a lot of questions on Instagram, and I've picked three to answer on issues that have come up a lot. Let's start with what will happen to all the civilians in Gaza? Well, the short answer is, we don't really know. What we do know is that the situation right now is dire, and it will get worse unless the war stops and humanitarian aid is allowed in. Remember, Gaza is a tiny, densely populated strip of Palestinian land. It's run by Hamas, but more than two million people live there and can't get out. Israel's bombing campaign has been the fiercest in recent memory. Israel says it's targeting Hamas fighters, but airstrikes have also hit residential buildings, schools, and clinics. On Tuesday, a strike on a hospital in the north of Gaza killed hundreds of people. Gaza health officials say it was an Israeli airstrike. The Israelis blamed a misfired rocket from the armed Palestinian group Islamic Jihad. Last week, Israel cut off food, fuel, water, and electricity supplies into Gaza, and supplies of everything are running out. Israel did allow drinking water into Gaza for about three hours on October 16th, but it was a fraction of what's needed according to the UN. The UN also says people are drinking salty water from agricultural wells and they're concerned about the spread of disease. Then there's the mass displacement of people. More than half of Gaza's population have had to leave their homes. There's also been a huge movement of people from the north of Gaza to the south, while Israeli airstrikes have continued everywhere. Israel told civilians living in the north, more than a million people, they had 24 hours to evacuate ahead of a possible ground invasion, something the UN said was impossible without devastating humanitarian consequences. And we still don't know for sure how many people did leave and how many stayed. Not everyone could leave. Others chose to stay or have now returned because conditions in the south are so bad. Bombardments did not stop in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, that's in Khan Yunus and Rafah. And that's why so many families who have evacuated south are going back now because at least, at least, um, if we're going to die, we're going to die with dignity in our homes. Egypt is the only country other than Israel that shares a border with Gaza. So there's a big focus on opening up that crossing, the Rafah crossing, as an aid route. Which brings us to our second question. Why can't Egypt send supplies or open the Rafah border? Now, there are a lot of issues tied up in that question. The backdrop is that Egypt and Israel generally have a pretty cooperative relationship. They signed a peace deal in 1979, and Egypt has often been a mediator in previous conflicts between Israel and Hamas. Even in so-called normal times, Israel maintains a siege on Gaza controlling who and what goes in and out. And that includes coordinating with Egypt about the movement of people and goods through the Rafah crossing. They're complicit with Israel in the siege uh, of uh, Gaza, which has been going on. And this is very hard for Palestinians and other Arabs to accept, but it's a, it's a reality. Understanding the current situation at the Rafah crossing depends on whether we're talking about aid getting in or people getting out. On the aid issue, Egypt always said it's been ready to send in supplies, but that they couldn't without a safety guarantee from Israel. 
and there's been a lot of Israeli bombing near the Rafah crossing. After U.S. President Joe Biden's trip to Israel, Israel now says it will not prevent humanitarian assistance from Egypt as long as it is only food, water, and medicine for the civilian population in the south, and as long as no supplies reach Hamas. There are trucks lined up at the border ready to go. Egypt's now agreed that 20 can go in, but it's not confirmed when. Now, when it comes to people getting out, the politics is even messier. Most of the diplomacy is focused on Palestinian dual nationals, so Palestinians who are also citizens of other countries. The U.S., for example, estimates there are around 600 Palestinian Americans trapped in Gaza right now. Usually, dual nationals would be able to get in and out of Gaza pretty easily using the Rafah crossing, but not now. I am a U.S. citizen. My country told me to come here. We went through hell coming through here. We don't know what's going on, why we were told to come, and when are we going to get out of here? It's hopeless. My message is to Secretary Blinken. If we were Israelis, would this happen to us? Then there's everyone else in Gaza. Given how dangerous Gaza is right now, a lot of people are wondering why all Palestinians can't flee to safety across the border to Egypt. Well, that's a scenario that Egypt and other Arab states have ruled out. Egypt sees that scenario as a national security risk that would spread Gaza's crisis into Egypt itself. And it says national security is a red line it won't cross. It also says it won't take in Palestinian refugees as a matter of principle. It says it stands by the goal of a two-state solution, meaning a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel, and that taking in large numbers of refugees would undermine that. Jordan's taking a similar position. Many Palestinians are worried about this too. That is a red line. Uh, because I think that is the plan by certain of the usual suspects to try and create de facto issues on the ground. No refugees in Jordan, no refugees in Egypt. If Egypt were to open its border and a million Palestinians would leave Gaza and go to Sinai, in theory just for temporary protection, the fear is they never go back. They don't want to suffer another Nakba, uh, where uh, half the Palestinian population in 1947-48 was driven out of Palestine or fled because there was war. And this is something that people are very aware of now on the, on the Egyptian front. Now, our last big question, which is actually two questions, where is this going to go? How is it going to end? While no one can predict the outcome of this, here are some things to consider. There's the risk that it becomes an even bigger war. Remember, Hamas is part of an alliance that includes the armed group Hezbollah in Lebanon and Iran. Israel has already been exchanging fire with Hezbollah across its shared border with Lebanon, and Iran's foreign minister has warned that it could take measures against Israel if they don't de-escalate, while Israel says it's ready for a bigger fight. We are prepared to fight, uh, if needs be, on two fronts. Uh, we have the ability to do so. We can do it on more fronts as well. Another thing to think about is how Israel's ground invasion might play out. We've been expecting it for almost a week now. Israel's called up hundreds of thousands of army reservists, and troops and tanks have been amassing in southern Israel near the Gaza border. But the longer a ground invasion doesn't happen, the more people are questioning whether the Israeli plans could change. There's been a slight shift in the messaging from the Israelis. On Tuesday, an army spokesperson said, everybody's talking about the ground offensive, it might be something different. And now there's also so much anger in Arab countries about the hospital strike in Gaza. Some analysts think that could also play into Israel's calculation on a ground invasion. Remember, there's a lot of diplomacy going on behind the scenes between Israel, the US, and Arab leaders. A ground invasion would mean urban warfare and even more casualties. Humanitarian organizations are warning that it would be disastrous for Palestinian civilians. There's also a huge risk that the captives being held by Hamas in Gaza, around 200 according to Israel, would end up getting hurt or killed. The Israelis are walking into a trap and they know it. The Israelis are very good in their air force they can destroy, we've seen what they have done in Gaza. They can level the city, but they cannot guarantee a success of the infantry. So how is this gonna end? Well, that depends what you think about Israel's stated goal. It says it's about wiping out Hamas, but many people are questioning what that really means or if it's even possible. They could kill many or all of the Hamas leaders, but that wouldn't do anything other than spark an even more um, determined and, and more militant movement that would follow some years 
down the road. Hamas is uh, an idea. Uh, it's a, a visceral, political, national, human response to uh, decades of occupation and subjugation. The truth is that the more they attempt to control Gaza and isolate Gaza and contain Gaza, the less secure Israel becomes, not the more secure. The story of Gaza, the struggle of the Palestinians, does not begin and end with Hamas. When you say victory, what do you mean? What's going to be of Gaza? What can we do to leverage this unsinkable round of bloodshed into a positive path forward? There should be choreography to address the core issues of this conflict. Security is one of them, but occupation. If you don't deal with occupation, you're doing nothing. And I'm saying that as an Israeli.